Welcome, everyone. My name is Julie Garden Robinson, and I'm your host and the coordinator of the 2022 Field of Fork webinar series. This is brought to you by North Dakota State University Extension. And this is the seventh year that we've done the series, and we're really glad you all have joined us today. Spring is coming, and so we're looking forward to all those wonderful things of spring. This next slide shows our upcoming webinars. I will be visiting with you next week about storing to composting foods. And after that, we will be hearing from Esther McGinnis, who is an associate professor and extension horticulturalist. Uh, she will be talking about gardening to fight hunger in our communities. The next slide shows our webinar controls. And because of our large number of participants, we invite you to post your comments in the chat. So we are going to practice finding and using the chat, and some of you have already started doing this. So click to open the chat and type in your city and state or country. So we have someone from Manitoba, so welcome. And while you're continuing to do that, I would like to um, provide an acknowledgement. This program is sponsored in part with grant funding from the USDA's Agricultural Marketing Service. And I will ask all of you to complete a very short online survey. It will be emailed to you right after today's webinar. And as a thank you, I will be providing prizes to the lucky winners of the random drawings. So be sure to include your complete address on the follow-up form. And don't forget to include your city, state, and zip code. And now I am really happy to introduce our guest speaker. Shannon Coleman currently serves as an assistant professor and state extension specialist in the Department of Food Science and Human Nutrition at Iowa State University. Dr. Coleman's extension and outreach work includes developing and disseminating food safety curricula and resources for emerging very small and small food manufacturers in Iowa. So welcome, Shannon, and it's all yours. Thank you, Julie. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, in today's presentation, I will be discussing with you food safety best management practices for usage, pr producing, and bottling honey. Um, this same presentation um, is, has been delivered to an on-campus class that we have here for beekeeping and honey production, as well as the Great Plains Master Beekeepers. So to provide to you an overview for today's presentation, I would first start off with the definition of standard of identity of honey. I will then provide you an overview of various state regulations here in the North Central region of the United States. And then I'll review um, food safety considerations on the consumer end, as well as food safety hazards in general. And then I'll provide some guidance as far as food safety management practices while um, bottling honey. So starting off with honey, um, to sell a food product, uh, food producers must understand the definition of the product. Often I get calls from those who want to make a specialized product and food inspectors will have them um, submit their products to be tested to ensure that it meets this definition. So on the um, end of honey, the FDA defines it as a thick, sweet, syrupy substance that bees make as food from the nectar of plants and secretions of living parts of the plant and stored in a honeycomb. And so I've had other people call about different maple, different syrups made out of barks and all of those different things. And so I always tell them going in the CFR or seeing how the FDA actually defines that um, food item helps you decide whether you are selling the appropriate item or not. So looking at the name of honey products, um, the um, the honey products contain only one product, one item or one ingredient, which is honey. And so the common name for honey is honey. And so that is the regulations listed there as far as the definition or the name to consider for honey. Um, other, another common name used for honey is clover honey. Um, and then when we talk about labeling, according to the FDA, um, 
honey is a single ingredient product. So your ingredient statement should just say honey. Um, people often also call and ask about whether they can add different sweeteners or different flavors of it. And then at that point, you are now changing the product. So a product consisted of honey and sweeteners cannot be labeled as honey. Um, and in the state of Iowa, where I um, work in, with people, um, we have a couple of people that put flavors in their honey, and they have to do that under a food processor license, and they have to get their honeys tested to make sure that they meet the proper definition or meet the safety standards as far as it being a shelf-stable product. So looking at regulations of sales is always broken down to... Um, to where people want to sell their products. And so based on where you want regulations, there are certain places that you can sell honey without a license. And then it is considered a cottage food product. Um, but depending on the state regulations, um, there may you may or may not need to use a cottage food license. So depending on what state you're from, um, you probably wanna look at those regulations or speak out, uh, reach out to your local um, extension offices to see about the regulations is about that. Um, others may want to sell their products wholesale retail. And so with that, you might need a food processor license and have your facilities inspected, but that's according to your state regulations. So when I did this presentation for the Great Plain Beekeepers Group, I polled my colleagues here in the North Central region about their regulations when it came to selling pure honey without a license. And so there are listed here. And so um, in Illinois, um, honey in a comb or removed from the comb uh, and an adulterated, unadulterated condition is exempt from inspections per the Illinois Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act. This is a restriction on there is a restriction on how much you can sell in Illinois. So there's a limit of 500 gallons per year and it must be um, extracted and bottled in the state inspected facility. Um, in Iowa, you can sell pure honey direct to consumers from your home or the farmer's market. Um, there are stringent regulations as far as processing or adding flavors to it. Um, in Kansas, um, you're allowed to sell direct to consumers without a license. In Minnesota, um, honey, honey and maple syrup are considered products of the farm, and they can be sold at the farmer's market without a license. However, if you add flavor, it is considered a cottage food, and there are restrictions for reselling and doing special labels. For Missouri, all vendors um, who want to sell, sell less than um, 50000 per year and sell directly to consumers, that does not include internet sales or um, farmers markets. Um, there is no license needed to sell directly to consumers. And in Wisconsin, we have Dr. Inga Mon. If you are from Wisconsin, she probably can answer more direct questions. You do not need a license to extract your honey, package it, um, to sell to your sell your own honey from your bees, but there are stringent regulations on processing, such as canning, heating, straining the honey, and sales can occur directly to consumers at the farmers market or even on the internet. And so that is why the network that Julie and I co-lead, the North Central Region, is a great re is a great resource to everyone out here in our region. Um, listed here are the people that responded to me in those emails and gave me those different regulations per state. So if you are from those states, that'll be your point of contact to contact about your regulations in your state about selling pure honey or flavored honey and whether that you can do that or not. I did put the regulations for North Dakota in the chat. So okay. we have lots of people from North Dakota. You can click on that link and it'll take you right to our North Dakota rules. All right, so next going into food safety considerations. So this was a fact sheet that I found um, from Clemson University that talked about some consumer um, food safety issues, considerations to consider as far as honey goes. So the primary food safety issue when it comes to honey is infant botulism. And so because infants have a compromised immune system and gastrointestinal tract, the spores, the Clostridium botulinum, um, could provide an environment um, 
in their in their um in their GI tracts that could produce um those toxins over time and make the um the baby sick over time. And so that's why it is commonly recommended that babies under the age of one should not eat honey. Um, thinking about your storage of your honey and um, you want to make sure that you have it in an airtight container. So honey is hydroscopic. So it means that it draws in moisture. And so additional moisture to the honey can make it un can make it favorable conditions for mold, yeast, and yeast growth and those in it. Um, I recently had some mold grow in my organic maple syrup that I put in my cupboard and not the refrigerator. So I think I'm gonna win the argument with my dad that syrup should go in the refrigerator now. Um, so I, I, even with me being a food safety person, some of those same things that can happen to the regular consumer um, also happens to me. And then the final recommendation they have is honey, may have crystals or granulated um, parts that show up as they get older, and especially if it's refrigerated or frozen. Um, it's a natural process that does not harm the honey in any way. To convert the crystals back to its liquid form, you wanna place the honey in an open jar that's heat safe container and have it in one to two inches of hot, not boiling water, and then those crystals would say would move would disappear over time. You want to be careful to not overheat it, um, because excessive heat could ch um, change the color of your honey and your flavor. And so you want to maintain that yummy flavor that you love from your fresh honey, but you also want to get rid of those crystals. So going into food hazards and honey. So starting off with just a basic definition of food hazards, foods, hazard, foods can become um, hazard by contamination. Um, contamination is the unattended presence of harmful stuff, substance or microorganisms in food. So food um, can become contaminated three different ways, um, chemical, physical, and biological hazards. So listed here are some general um, hazards that could be that it could occur with pasteurized honey. So chemical hazards could be phenols, antibiotics, chemical residues found in barrels that you may wanna store it in, metal lids um, or pails. So you wanna make sure that you use appropriate uh, food grade safe containers when you are storing in um, your honey. Physical hazards could be medical, metal fragments, non-metal particles such as um, wood, stones, and glass, and, and even dirt. We'll talk a lot about dirt and how those physical hazards could lead to some form of contamination when we're talking about bottling. Um, the only biological hazard um, that I've seen listed so far is that Clostridium botulinum spores. And with that, um, as we said before, when we talked about regulations, um, canning, if you do improper canning, you could be um, introducing an environment that this um, bacteria could survive in. So you wanna make sure that you're careful with how you are um, handling your honey. And so why are we talking about the spores of um, botch of Clostridium botulinum is because it produces toxins. And so botulism is a rare but severe illness that is caused by a toxin that attacks your body ner nerves and causes difficulty breathing, muscle paralysis, and even death. The bacteria that makes botulin botulinum toxins are found naturally in places. Um, it's still rare for them to make people sick. Um, but still could be a risk. So we try to make sure that we warn people, um, especially if there is a possibility of risk. So the bacteria make spores that um, act as a protective coating. Those spores help the bacteria survive in the environment and they can survive either under um, extreme conditions. So the spores do not cause people to become sick, even if they are eating, but under certain circumstances, the spores can grow and make um, someone make the most um, lethal toxin known. So that is why we, you know, when we talk about canning and other considerations that you make sure that you are aware of some of, some of these things so that you're not um, putting someone in an uncomfortable environment. 
So looking into best practices, food safety management practices when it comes to bottling honey, um, starting off with sanitation guides. So um, when you are setting up your um, to bottling honey, you want to first consider your sanitary design of your honey making facility. You want to first make sure that um, it is that you have a separate bottling space for your, when you're bottling honey from other activities that are going on. So there's a lot of different farms that have honey and produce and meats and everything. So having that separate space. Um, and so in these next few slides, we'll talk about that. And so starting with this um, exterior part of it, the first thing you want to cons consider is your exterior space. So when you're setting up, you want to make sure that your exterior space is clean. So you want to make sure that the grass is cut, that there's no tall grass, um, that there's no outside, no, no entry from the outside inside that could lead to contamination. So the ultimate thing is what you want to make sure if you're minimizing um, contamination by making sure that there's no outside activities going into your inside your activities. And so mentioning once again that there is you have your cut grass, um, sealing the outside of your building to, in, to eliminate pests to come in your facilities. Next for our sanitation guidelines is interior. So the actual place that you are um, actually bottling, you want to make sure that you want to minimize the, the, um, the instance of any harborage of pests or any microorganisms. So your space should be cleanable and it should be clean um, properly um, before you get started and make sure all, all, all of your food contact surfaces are also properly cleaned. Um, lastly, you want to make sure that you are protecting your product. So you want to limit who can enter in your bottling space. So um, for your employees and others, you want to make sure that you have certain people that can enter the space and those who cannot. Thinking about the equipment you'll be using for bottling, um, we talked about having a cleanable space. You also want to include and make sure that um, the equipment that you use also meet the proper standards. So when we talk about your equipment, walls and ceilings, you want to make sure that they're hard, flat and smooth surfaces. You want to make sure that the surface of the equipment is resistant to any cleaning and sanitizing solution. You also want to make sure that you are using approved sanitizers for food grade work. So making sure that you're reading those labels and understanding whether it could be used in that space or not, because you don't want any chemical hazards coming in as far as your bottling um, goes. And then lastly, you want to make sure that your equipment is installed correctly and sealed. Um, making sure all the pits and cracks um, that could harbor foodborne pathogens or any other contaminant, um, making sure that they're all properly sealed and cleanable. And um, the space for your bottling should also be covered because you don't want um, an open space that any birds or any pests can come in and possibly contaminate your product. So, um, Another thing to consider is the hygienic practices of your handlers. So the first line of defense of reducing foodborne illness during production is making sure that your employees have safe handling practices. So listed here are a few considerations to, to think of. And so the first is um, if someone is ill, um, especially with symptoms that are listed there, you want to make sure that they stay home. Number two is um, the big thing for the past couple of years is washing your hands. Um, and if you look above my head with my image, I've had a wash your hands sign for a while. It used to be outside my door. Now that I have a, de a decorative sign above, um, I make sure we put that message out there to wash your hands. So it does, does not mean that you should just wash your hands at the start of bottling. Um, you want to make sure that people are washing their hands when they use the bathroom, after eating lunch, um, if they are handling money or any other things, making sure that they wash their hands then, or if their hands become soiled with any honey or debris. So say if there's an overflow of honey and it gets on their hands, stopping cleaning your hands before you go and um, 
and um, touch your product again. And then finally, there should be no eating, drinking, or the use of tobacco while handling your products. Um, so you want to have the design areas where your employees can go take breaks that are separate from the place that you are bottling. So um, making sure that your um, employees are following safe practices help also keep your space clear as far as any contaminants. So thinking about extraction day, um, when you get ready to extract your um, honey from the comb on extraction day, there are um, things to consider um, while you're getting yourself prepped. Um, first thing is coming up with your standard operating procedures of how you want to clean before and after the day of extraction. So coming up with how you want the surfaces clean, whether they need to swap, um, sweep or mop your floors. Um, but when we think about um, honey extraction that most people are extracting it from the comb itself. So you need uh, the proper equipment. So when you use a extractor um, for the honey comb, you wanna make sure that it is properly sealed so that no dust, dirt, rodents, or any other contaminants can get in there um, in your honey. So you wanna reduce those, um, that ability of any um, contaminants coming into your final product. And then you also wanna make sure you have a standard operating procedure for checking your um, surfaces, so your ceiling walls, floors, making sure that they're free of any dust, debris, or um, cobwebs. And then one thing we also try to remind people too, so at, with the honey, you'll have that comb left over. And so um, making sure that you're removing your trash and having a standard oper operating procedure for that as well. And so that, is all that I have as far as um, honey and food safety. So I'll take your questions. All right, you have several questions. And first of all, thank you, Shannon. In the chat, for those of you from North Dakota who are interested, I did post a link to the North Dakota regulations. They are through the North Dakota Department of Agriculture. And if you click on that, you'll see that there is licensing required. So remember, you know, to Google North Dakota Department of Agriculture and honey, and then you will easily get that information. Um, Cindy from Nebraska shared that Nebraska can sell pure non-flavored honey under the cottage food registration. And she also linked that information. And uh, in Colorado, pure honey or infused honey can be sold to the end consumer as a cottage food product. And that's limited to $10,000 per product per year. And their information is under the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment website. So those are resources. I see that people are from all over the Midwest. So we're happy to have you here. Now, I actually have a question for you, Shannon. Mm -hmm. Two of them on the same sort of topic. And I'll give you both of them. Is it okay to microwave crystallized honey in the original container like a honey bear? And then someone else says, I have heated my crystallized honey in the microwave on low power to melt the crystals. Is this safe? Um, so I'm going off of the fact sheet that I got the information from. And so it gave very strict um, rules. So saying that you're using, that you should put it in a safe container and then put it in a heat safe container. We're unsure if that the nice bear honey <laughs> container is a heat safe container. So you putting it over into a different container and, and um, making sure that you put it in hot, not boiling water is what they suggested. And I would just follow that. Um, and then I think the same person added to the chat, the honey is in an open glass jar when warmed on low power in the microwave and it doesn't change colors. Okay. So if that works for you, I, I would say it works for you, but I would, for me, I would follow those instructions that was given in that document. Um, I would stick to that because even when we went and visited um, a big food company, they, they have different microwaves for them to test their frozen foods that um, they give people strict instructions on how to heat their foods. And so they have different 
rooms with different microwaves so they can test it. And so that to me, it was showing me that there are different variations in different microwaves. And that's probably why they gave that recommendation about using the, given those specific um, directions about how to heat, reheat your honey. All right. Uh, another person asked about the type of pests you were describing, insects, rodents. What, what do you mean by pests? So um, in food safety and also this Southern girl, all of it is pests. So rodents, <laughs> insects, all of it um, with honey is going to attract. Um, I know the insects, um, um, they will come if, you know, things are not properly sealed or you leave the door open too much. So, um, so all of it is considered pest. I wouldn't know what type of pest you would have at your, your space. Uh, my students are still trying to work on me to stop calling mice rats, but where I'm from, they're rats. So, um, but so just making sure whatever space you are, you have a pest management um, process to make sure that you're doing it in an appropriate clean space. Um, Roger asks, is whipped honey considered processed? Hmm, that I do not know. Um, do you do any form? I guess if he could tell us how how he makes his whipped honey or anything like that, that would probably be a conversation that you also just take to your local inspectors. And so that's the conversation I've been having with a lot of um, producers here now. It's just... Um, with whatever product you want to do, having a good conversation with your inspectors about whether they consider that processing or not, and taking the the, the proper um, steps to um, to get the license, appropriate license of that. And Becky tells us that plastic honey bears melt, so I'm guessing that's from experience. So thank mm -hmm. you, Becky. Um, Jean asks, go ahead. So somebody put in the chat that whipped honey is half crystallized honey and half fluid honey whipped together. So in my state, that whole process of whipping and mixing the two, they would probably consider that as processing. But that would the what I've learned is this is what I've been doing since the pandemic. Talk to the inspectors. They told me to get out the conversation. So I'm out of the conversation. You talk to them. And when you need food safety training, come back to me. <laughs> Um, Jean asks about making a spreadable honey like a jelly. Have you had any experience with that? No, I have not because we we keep it very strict, especially with that beekeeping course we have here on campus. It is just pure honey that we work with. And I'll just add that I've worked with people that make honey butter and mm -hmm. that does require, you know, a visit and a license and all that sort of thing, because that is a processed food with more than one ingredient. Um, I added to the chat, just because I was expecting this question, I found the answer for you ahead of time. So if you want to can or make syrups using honey as a sweetener, I have listed the link directly to the National Center for Home Food Preservation, which is a great source of home canning information. Uh, generally, you can use half, um, you can replace half of the sugar with honey. But it's always best when you're doing home food preservation that you find a tested recipe. And so you can go to that site and find more information. Okay, Mary says, my husband put the hardened honey out in the sun on the deck last summer during one of those really hot days and it liquefied very well. Yeah. Yeah, so some people do that, just like my friend loves to put her soups out in the snow to chill it off. She goes, I'm following food safety. And I'm like, okay, I just hope nobody come and touch it. <laughs> we know any pests come and touch it. So, um, yeah. Uh, Kathy asks about the honey butter available online. Boy, why don't you check the Pride of Dakota website, just Pride of Dakota honey and that would get you to the department of agriculture site and they have a lot of things available online and i'm not sure if honey butter is among those that would have to be kept cold during transport so it might not be but if you want to make your own honey butter i'll just go to allrecipes.com you can make a little batch and have it in your refrigerator and enjoy it 
as I as I mentioned, Kathy followed up just allrecipes.com will certainly have a honey butter recipe or just take butter, <laughs> mix it to your sweetness satisfaction and use it at home. If you want to sell it, it's a whole other story though. Mm -hmm. Okay, Stacy adds that whipping honey makes it spreadable like jelly. Um, I just, I've seen a lot of people get interested. And like I said, in the past two years with the beekeeping course that we have here, um, it's almost like I do a quick food safety training before the students actually go through the process of extracting the honey. So my department chair was like, you need to talk to them first. And I was like, you know, and I told them, you know, if you get the honey on your hand, don't just lick it off because <laughs> <laughs> you may contaminate it. So um, trying to do a quick crash, crash, crash course for um the students and then with the the one of the faculty members for that class also said hey can you come and talk to the great plains people about it and so i did that as well just so that they are aware especially because i know a lot of people want to put flavors in their honeys and try to still sell it and i'm like wait <laughs> and i've seen some people put pepper flakes and stuff like that and um biggest thing with that is that you are a pure honey by itself is shelf stable and shouldn't support the growth of any um, microorganisms, especially if you keep your practices safe when you're bottling it. When you're introducing those flavors and other, other ingredients, you're now changing the ingredients, the formulation of it, and you could be putting um, the product itself at risk. Uh, another comment about honey bears in the microwave. Um, you know, I'll, I'll just make a comment. In general, we don't like people to put plastic containers that might not be microwave safe into the microwave oven just because we want to err on the side of extreme safety. So we generally don't recommend that. When I have honey that crystallizes, I just put some warm water in my sink and I put my container in there and I find that works well for me. Yeah. Like we were saying with the physical and chemical hazards, um, you know, the bottle itself with the company is food grade safe. Um, we have a packaging guy here on campus. And so they, if you heat it or if you do any man, manipulation of the packaging, there could be some things that are released from that packaging that then makes it unsafe because you're now altering the, the setup of that packaging. All right. Well, I hope you all enjoy honey. And I will add that um, North Dakota is the leading producer of honey. I just noticed that on our North Dakota agriculture site. So I think we're in states in the Midwest where lots of honey is produced. And it certainly is a tasty sweetener to use in your various products from tea to cookies. And then someone said about they receive raw honey from a friend that has a hive. Is it safe to eat? Um, if we go by the definition that the FDA has, raw honey from the hive is safe for consumption. So it's called honey. All right. Um, Becky had one final comment. I used to make hard suckers um, using honey. They were great. And I felt I wasn't doing great damage to kids. Yeah. And I guess, but, and then it, I think the recommendation that was from that fact sheet is um, up to the age of one. Right. Yeah, under the age of one. So um, you really would just want to make sure that you're following um, the pr appropriate protocols when it comes to certain foods. Oh, you have another one. How long is honey safe to store? Hmm. I've had mine over a year <laughs> before. Um, so we probably can look at some different there. I know Nebraska has a, a whole food storage um, document that they developed and we can see of honeys on that list. Probably calling Cindy out, <laughs> our colleague Cindy B. <laughs> Honey has a very long shelf life, actually, really mm -hmm. long. And you'll learn a lot more about where to look up information on how long to safely store foods in my talk next week. So I'll be providing you with some 
apps you could download and there's a USDA app on food storage. Oh, here we go. Mm -hmm. Cindy has posted something for best quality up to 12 months after that. It remains safe, but the quality may not be as good. Can yep. And I just found their document and on yep. there it said for honey, molasses and syrup one year. Yep. So like, like a lot of things, it loses quality over time. Mm -hmm. So it may not be a safety thing anymore. Um, it may be a quality it may be the way it tastes, the color, the crystallization, and all of that. So I've I've permanently stopped buying honey because the honey group, the beekeeping group, gives me honey every year. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have to buy any. <laughs> well, I am going to post in the chat just because we still have lots of people online. Um, this is the survey that I'd really appreciate your input on. Uh, again, honey is a specialty crop and this was made possible. We've been doing these, this is the seventh year. Um, these are made possible with funding support. So again, appreciate your feedback on the survey. And as a little bonus, you might even win a really cool prize and you can win more than one. I will keep track of who has won. If you win twice, you get a different prize. Yeah. And then I think Julie has posted the slides um, from my presentation. They have links in them. I've rechecked them again this week to make sure that they work. So you can go into the different resources that I use to help develop this presentation. With that, I thank you very much, Shannon. This was very informative and now I want some honey. <laughs> <laughs> look, I might have, look, let me see if I can ship you some or when I see you next, I might have a lot. <laughs> that sounds very good. Thank you all for joining us and please continue to join us. Next week will be our midpoint, the fifth webinar and I'll be your speaker and we'll be talking a lot about food storage and composting and reducing food waste. Mm -hmm.